Getting into the home stretch of early voting and to election day, we devote this hour to some of the most watched races in South Florida, and we start with the race for Miami Dade's top prosecutor. The two candidates are together with us today. Catherine Fernandez Rundle, incumbent Miami Dade state attorney since 1993, running for an eighth term. And Melba Pearson, a former prosecutor in the state attorney's office for 15 years. Most recently, she has been the deputy director of the ACLU of Florida. Ladies, good morning. Great good morning. to have you on. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning, Glenn, and good morning, everyone. Thank you. And we are going to use first names here because both Lena and I have known both of you for many, many years. Uh, Kathy Rundle, let me begin with a, uh, I think, a serious question that's going to be asked, has been asked in this campaign. You've been the state attorney for 27 years. In that time, you have never charged a on-duty cop with murder. There is one prominent case involving a prison inmate named Darren Rainey. He was schizophrenic. He was doing two years on cocaine possession at a state prison. South Dade as punishment. Two corrections officers put him in a scalding hot shower for nearly two hours. He died. It took you five years to decide that no charges would be filed. Why didn't you file in against those corrections officers? Okay, a couple of things. Um, you know, when we watched that rainy portrait, it really was very heartbreaking for so many of us to see that. But then, you know, when you look at the science of it, what a prosecutor has to do is rely on what a medical examiner says. In the state of Florida, state law says the medical examiner for that community, it does not relate it to me. The, the medical examiner is a separate independent pathologist that conducted the autopsy on Mr. Rainey. And that determination by this expert, this outside independent expert was that it was not a homicide, that there were no burns on his body. There were no burns on his feet, which would have supported the allegation that he was standing in a hot shower. Yeah, With Kathy, that, if, I may, if I may interrupt you, let me just, if I may, yeah. uh, we know Dr. Emma Lou reached that conclusion. She's a fine uh, forensic pathologist. Uh, however, a independent uh, forensic pathologist was hired by the family and they determined that in fact, uh, there had been serious burns that had caused his death. Did you just so, ignore so in those criminal, conclusions? In the criminal arena, there's a much different standard than there is in the civil arena. So in the civil arena, which is a lower standard of proof, and you can, the lawyers, that's what they do. They hire experts. They, they get expert testimony to support their civil case. But in the criminal arena, our burden is much higher our, our ethical obligation is much stronger. We have to be able to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence. Kathy, and the, the, evidence was, the, the, evidence, excuse me, the evidence by the doctor, the chief pathologist for our community, who under the law makes that decision, was that it was not a homicide. My hands were tied. Kathy, you have used that argument, uh, be able to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, to talk about the criticisms of your office not charging on-duty police officers with murders in several decades. I want to take this question to Melba Pearson. Uh, that actually, in context, is a pretty normal operation in the state of Florida. Only one police officer has been convicted in 30 years. And so using that standard as um, being able to prosecute a case beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury, how would you do things differently, seeing as the standards to prosecute uh, police officers criminally is very high and broad in the state of Florida? Of course. Thanks so much for that question, Glenna. So at the end of the day, the prosecutor's duty is to make sure that you're seeking equitable justice for everyone. And there has been so many missed opportunities under my opponent's watch, including the Darren Rainey case, because I vastly differ uh, from her analysis of the facts. And also it is very clear that a manslaughter charge could have been substantiated based on the evidence that was made available, including the medical examiner's report. So what I intend to do differently, number one, is to create a civil rights unit. And in my civil rights unit, I will have dedicated prosecutors who only work on police misconduct and police 
shooting cases. Having been in that office and done the work, I know how it operates. Basically, you have your day-to-day caseload and your assignment that you have as a prosecutor, and then on a volunteer basis, you end up taking one or two police shooting cases or one or two hate crimes cases, that sort of thing. But Melvin, so the, I, qu- the question is really, if the evidence does not rise to reasonable doubt, I- isn't there a- an ethical standard by which a prosecutor needs to meet to, to bring a case without that standard, is, is that an ethical decision? Oh, I mean, of, of course. First of all, you cannot file a case unless you have enough evidence to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Period. End of story. I mean, you, you have an ethical obligation. You have a legal obligation. And I've never deviated from that. But the difference is, if there is evidence, you can't say, oh, I don't know if we're going to win this case, so let me not file charges. The standard is not whether or not you're 100% going to get a guilty verdict. You can never guarantee what a jury is going to come back with, ever. Even with the most quote-unquote slam dunk facts that you can have, you still don't know that you're going to get a guilty verdict. But you have to go into it knowing that you have the evidence to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. And just to put a, and just to put a, a cap on, on this particular issue, Kathy, is there any case that you've uh, decided not to try that you, in hindsight, might feel differently about, may, might bring to a grand jury if you hadn't done that or may reopen? Uh, in in hindsight and with what you've learned? Yeah, Glenna, I, you know, we're, we're the science, I can't argue with the science in the Darren Rainey case. It's just the science is what it is. But I want to go back to something because there's two things I would like to address, Glenna. One is my opponent has said before she would just take something to trial regardless. I'm glad to hear now that she's saying that would violate that. ethical, ethical obligations. Number two, we have the finest teams, both look at, we have specialized unit that looks at all of these police misconduct cases. And, and we, we prosecuted over 500 police and correctional officers during that time. That's all specialized folks looking at it. And on the police shooting side, as you know, I think we're the only prosecutor's office in Florida that sends our lawyers out to the scene, two lawyers. And they, we have a committee They staff those cases. They work diligently on those cases. They're the best eyes. They're the veterans, the most experienced lawyers we have. And I call them the best team in America at that state attorney's office because they really do. So the notion that we don't have the best eyes, the best intentions, that we do the best investigations is just is, is a wrong notion that my opponent keeps putting out. It's a bad narrative to say that about that wonderful uh, group, that team of hardworking men and women at the state attorney's yeah. office. Uh, Melba, you are the reform candidate in this race. Uh, you have said essentially that the state attorney's office, where you worked for 15 years, is ossified, it's stagnant, it needs to be shaken up. Give us an example or two of where you would shake things up. Certainly. So first off, we have to start with how our young people are being treated. Uh, the Unfortunately, the office has had a very horrible habit of direct filing juveniles. 96% of the juveniles that were direct filed, which is taken out of the juvenile system and placed into the adult system to face accountability, 96% of those juveniles who were direct filed for nonviolent offenses between 2014 and 2018 were black and brown kids. Now, that's a problem because when we want to make sure that justice is equal for everyone, when we want to make sure that there's no inequalities or disparate treatment, this clearly flies in the face of it, especially since we know no child has the monopoly on crime. So first off, I would end the practice of direct filing juveniles, except if otherwise directed by law. Kathy, Se- can, you, can you put some context to that? Is that factual? Uh, and please put thank that in you. context. I, I do appreciate that opportunity to clarify that because, again, it's a, a very twisted narrative that she puts out there. First of all, um, the police make the arrests. And secondly, we, got, we must recognize that we have something called juvenile civil citations. So I just want to put some meat on this framework. So civil citations is kids get cited instead of arrested. And so that is something that we actually authored and got passed in the legislature. So we're very proud of that. Then after you have those that are cited, you then have about, let's take 2019, 
you had approximately 3,000 juveniles that were arrested and brought into the system. 1,000 of those automatically are diverted. The others stay within the juvenile system. The only number of cases that went into the adult system were 56 in 2019. So if you take the larger perspective of 3,000, you're down to such a small percentage. And yes, the law says it was mandatory um, transfer to adult court. Doesn't mean they're going to go into adult sanctions, but it means they're going to be handled and supervised out of the adult system. And you know what? King Carter, King Carter was shot and killed at six years old by a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, an 18-year-old. Yes, we direct filed on those children. All and right. you know what? There were kids with guns who were very dangerous. We have some of those. In 2019, the 16 out of the 56 that were discretionary were ours. And six of them were charged with murder, and the other were charged with a variety of armed robbery cases, armed jacking, sex battery, meeting rape cases, et cetera. All right. So, last, Kathy, last, hold, yeah. hold on, if you will. Kathy Rundle, Melba Pearson, we're having a very lively debate here live on This Week in South Florida. We'll be back with more in just a minute. We are back with our mini debate between incumbent Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle and challenger Melba Pearson, who worked in that office for 15 years. Melba, I want to start there. You were the deputy chief of the Career Criminal Division, and as such, you would have been in the position to argue vociferously for the minimum mandatory sentences for career criminals. Next job was as a deputy director of the ACLU, where uh, an organization that is advocating eliminating those severe minimum mandatories. Where do you stand now on that? Certainly. So first, I need to go back to one thing that my opponent said. When I made the comments earlier, I stated very clearly I was looking at the data between 2014 to 2018 having to do with nonviolent offenses. My opponent spoke about a whole different year, 2019, and spoke about violent offenses, which was not what I was addressing. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Going back to your question, Glenna, uh, I am opposed to minimum mandatories in many cases because of the fact that they result in often disproportionate outcomes. When I was assistant chief, I usually waived minimum mandatories for the majority of cases if there weren't, you know, some ex exacerbating circumstances that would have required that scheme. But we also have to appreciate not everybody views cases in the same way. So we have to make sure that we're being equitable. And again, one group of people doesn't get a disproportionate impact in comparison to other similarly situated people. So that is why I'm definitely advocating for a, a definite change in minimum mandatories and focusing more on restoration, rehabilitation, using techniques like restorative circles that have proven to be very effective in other jurisdictions yeah. in reducing violence and reducing recidivism. Uh, Kathy Rundle, uh, this morning, the Miami Herald, and here is the editorial page of the Herald, gives you a recommendation, but it's kind of lukewarm. Here's what they say at one point. This is not a full-throated, unequivocal endorsement of the incumbent, of you. Uh, her 27-year tenure has been at times flawed, at times infuriating, at times befuddling. She can and she must do better. What would you say to the voters of Miami-Dade County, many of whom probably agree with that assessment? Well, you know, absolutely, we can always do better. All of us need to always be self-examining. Um, self-reflective, communities change, problems change, and so do we as a prosecutor's office. So over the course of my career there, in, in, in addition to putting together an outstanding team that leads that office, one of the largest in the United States, 1,200 employees, over 300 lawyers, over 55,000 criminal cases, and, and, and we have a child support enforcement division that does about 80,000 cases and collected over $182 million last year, we know that we can't stay static. And so what I and our team do is every year we create something. We're either changing how we do business, we're innovating programs. And so if you look over the course of those 27 years, it's not perfect for sure. Yeah. And we make tens of thousands of decisions 
and we realize that many times people aren't going to understand the decisions, and at least 50% of the time, someone's disagreeing with us. Kathy, However, Kathy, if you look I, at I, the larger I, picture, Michael, yeah. you will see that there have been a number of very important, great innovations, such as our, as our sex trafficking unit, our mental therapeutic courts, veterans courts, drug courts, these are all alternative pathways to incarceration yeah. we, that we have created. We understand, uh, excuse me, Kathy, we understand you run a really big, complicated operation. Here's just one spe specific follow-up here to what you're saying. In both the um, uh, Rainey case and in that of Edward Foster, the Homestead man shot to death five years ago, you have sometimes had these cases which go on for years without a decision. We understand the course of justice sometimes is not always swift, but why does it take your office so long in some of these cases to reach a conclusion? Well, um, those two cases, I would consider them outliers. I do not consider them to be the normal average case. And they were, one, the rainy was too long because they really, for a whole bunch of reasons, you all know, it's a 75 page report, it's on our website, you can go look at it. But really the medical examiner didn't make its determination to many years later, I believe that's accurate. In the Foster case, one of the reasons, unfortunately, that it's taking so long is that we're trying to work with the defense counsel and the family every time there's a new witness, we try to attempt to get them so that we get all the evidence to make a decision, not on 90% of the evidence, but on all the evidence. But again, having said that, those are outlier cases. The major we have streamlined our cases, Michael, and you'll see over time, especially when FDLE, which is what I advocated for and brokered for our community, once they came in and started doing their investigations of the police shooting and in custody deaths, it went much faster, much smoother. We now have a complete status report since 2017 on every single one of those cases. Where is it going? What's the status of it? And the report is online so that everybody can see what we did and how we did it and how we reached the conclusion that we did. In the short time we have left, I want to I just want to make the point that this is a Democratic primary, but because there is no Republican candidate, this is a race open to all voters. So I, I want to give you both a very quick chance. Let's start with Melba. What as a Democratic candidate and a progressive candidate what do you or will you offer a more conservative Miami-Dade voter if you become state attorney? One of the things that I have been uh, hearing from different folks as I go to the different polling stations, as I travel about the county or do various forums, is that people are very concerned about public corruption. And that is something that really concerns conservative voters. And even conservative voters have a lot of concerns about policing as well, as evidenced by the diverse coalition of people that are out protesting and raising their voices around this, these issues, as well as maybe not protesting, but posting on social media or writing op-ed. So it is clear that the community is concerned about these issues. And I am the person to take this office into the next, you know, eight years, 12 years, take things into a new direction and really implement the great practices that have been going on across the country. I will say this, my opponent has built a foundation but I intend to build a house and really make things better for the people of Miami-Dade County. If they want to see a change, if they're dissatisfied, as so many people have expressed, they're dissatisfied with the way things have been going for the last 27 years, it's time for a change. The people demand change, and I am the person that represents that change. Kathy Rundle, 30 seconds to close. Oh, great, 30 seconds. Well, um, I just, I would say this to the, com the community that's watching. If you want someone that has a CEO, a chief executive officer's experience in managing a big law firm and a criminal justice system leader, then I think that I am the one that you want. I'm the one that's proven that I know how to reform laws. I know how to build a good team. We've reduced the crime rate in Day County based on our smart crime initiatives to by 70% which is the lowest it's been in the last 30 years. That's what this community wants. They wanna be safe, they wanna feel safe, they wanna know that we're the guardians and doing everything we hum humanly possible to protect them, 
their families, and their children. Kathy Rundle, Melba Pearson, always great to watch two litigators go at it. <laughs> we appreciate your time. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much. much.